why don't we perfect well, let me get started so thank you everyone for joining and uh for those of you who um don't as usual please uh kind of mute your your computers um as you join uh so this is my my unique uh, privilege to introduce one of my friends and and somebody I met, um, I, I want to say probably a decade ago now, but a, yeah, a fairly long, long time, time ago, back in very cold weather. And we both made our way down south, fortunately, uh, out of the cold weather. But uh, uh, many of you know, and, and I don't have to introduce too much, but but uh, Dr. Chim is a, a uh, phenomenal uh, academic hand surgeon, a leader in our field, um, uh, going to be future president of of multiple size one day, and also um, is a uh, phenomenal microsurgeon and 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 uh, peripheral nerve and plexus surgeon. So it's really an honor to have him come talk to us and and speak with us, um, and uh, honored to Harvey, honored to uh, get to see all the cool things that you're doing. So congratulations, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much. It's it's really an honor to be here, you know, and to and to talk to your group and and meet everybody. It's great to see you guys. Uh, hi, Mike. It's good to see you as well. So let me just share my screen. Um, so All right. Can you guys see everything? All right. So yes. uh, great. Well, you know, thank you again for having me. It's really an honor to be here. It's really great to, to speak to your group. Um, I've really been amazed about how the Emory Group has grown over the recent years, and it's really amazing to see the, the things you guys are doing. But tonight, I just want to talk about uh, advances in microsurgical reconstruction of the hand and upper extremity. And I just want to share some of my personal experiences and thoughts. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. So this is kind of a, a bit of a personal journey. I like to talk about my personal journey and my favorite flaps. I started doing more muscle flaps, and one of the flaps that I really like doing uh, was the split latissimus flap. And this is a little bit different from the traditional latissimus flap that I'm sure you're all familiar with. We'll talk a bit more about this. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about modifications on traditional skin flaps. And um, our work cost flap nowadays is a super thin profunda artery perforator flap, which I'll talk about as well. And this, is, uh, this has proven very useful for upper extremity and lower extremity reconstruction. Another thing that I've been doing a lot recently is ultrasound and flap planning. And I really think this has revolutionized uh, my practice because, you know, it's like your, your, somebody has said it was like a surgeon's uh, or hand surgeon's stethoscope. So you know exactly where the perforator is. You can map the flap around it and you know exactly where you're going. Save time. And if we have time, I'd like to talk a little bit about bone and composite reconstruction as well as decision making and extremity reconstruction. So I'd like to start by just talking about the, oops. Okay, about extremity reconstruction. So uh, first, what needs to be reconstructed? Skin, tendon, or muscle, bone. Can you do this with one flap? Uh, how many ways can the flap be designed? And is there hardware involved? So there's hardware involved, I much prefer muscle compared to skin flaps. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. So a pretty typical case, uh, forearm skin defect, Montegia fracture dislocation that I treated with a traditional muscle flap. So here you can see, um, and there's this line that's going across my screen. I'm not sure if, if I'm responsible for it. I don't know if you guys can see it. I can see it. It might be a zoom feature, actually, like a zoom drawing thing or something. Oh, I don't okay. know how to. I don't know how to get it off. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it just it's an it's, oh, a yeah, zoom on a, it's a zoom a oh, zoom annotation. You just need to go up the top and click the downward arrow, and then clear annotations. Oh, okay. Oh. Nice. Okay. There great, you go. great, great. Awesome. So this is a patient of a Montegia fracture dislocation. You can see a pretty bad wound. So after it was reduced, there's still a very large wound of exposed bone. So in this case, uh, this was early in my career, I decided to do a split latissimus flap. We wrote up our series of uh, function sparing free split latissimus uh, flaps in the JBJS about a few years ago. And this was a series of uh, uh, flaps for low extremity reconstruction for two patients with flap survival of 95%, limb salvage 100%. And we found when we did this uh, flap in a split form, preserving the posterior division of the thoracoid also nerve, there was minimal donor site mobility. The median dash was zero, median spadi was zero, and median AICS score was 100. So uh, this is a bit different from the traditional latissimus flap. Um, I think the biggest difference is that it's harvested from the supine position, so it makes it much easier. Uh, and the second difference is that you're really preserving most of the muscle. So you're preserving the posterior division of the thoracodorsal nerve. So the remaining muscle is innervated, and you just harvest a strip of the muscle like this. So you can see on the figure on the right side, we just harvest a strip of the anterior border of the muscle compared to the full latissimus flap, which is seen in B. 
So the posterior portion of the muscle is preserved, it's function sparing in that the posterior division of the thoracodosal nerve is preserved, it's aesthetic sparing in that the posterior axillary fold is preserved, it can be harvested in supine position, and it's, it really allows a two-team approach. So uh, we, we compared our, our donor site mobility and outcomes uh, between a cohort of split lat and full lat patients, and this was published in PRS uh, last year. And uh, this was a three-year single center study. We looked at uh, about 32 split lat patients, 37 full lat patients. And then we looked at 22 from each cohort who, who actually agreed to return for assessment. And the mean duration of follow-up was 200 over days. And we found that in our split lat cohort, um, there was no donor site mobility in terms of shoulder weakness. So we actually measured the strength of shoulder adduction and push shock and there was MRC grade five in all patients, whereas in patients where the full latissimus flap, there were a number of patients who had weaker shoulder adduction. And looking at it objectively in terms of outcome measures, we found that the dash was significantly lower in patients who had a split lat a four and a 4.0, and in patients who had a full lat, the post-operative dash was 16.7, and there were similar uh, statistically significant differences in the SPARDI and ASDS scores. So, um, this study really showed there are greater functional deficits following full lat flaps compared to split lat flaps. And um, our, our DASH scores were consistent with the published literature showing that in general, the DASH scores are lower for patients who have muscle sparing, lat, or thoracodorsal artery perforator flaps. So the split lat flap, where, where possible, is a standard of care when we need a muscle flap in our institution. So this is just a quick video that I try and go through really quickly that I think is useful in illustrating it. So I'm not sure if you can hear the um, the the narration. This was one of my fellows, but here I am dissecting out the pedicle, um, and um, this is actually the anterior division of the thoracodorsal nerve. And then we're able to cut the nerve. So then the posterior division of the nerve is preserved with the flap, and then the the pedicle to the posterior division of the of the muscle is divided. So I mean, the end result is the, the, the flap is actually, is actually um, supplied by the anterior division of the, of the thoracodorsal artery, and then you preserve the posterior division of the nerve, which remains to innervate the, the muscle. So you end up with a strip of muscle like this. You can tailor it according to the width and the, and the length that you need. And these are post-operative patients, and you can see that the scar along the flank really does not restrict shoulder abduction at all. And uh, in the immediate post operative period, you know, there's pretty good strength in shoulder adduction. You can see the posterior axillary fold is preserved, as you see over here. It's one of my patients doing a push off from a chair. Another one over here doing a dips. So this is, this is probably like a month after surgery. So, you know, obviously the donor site mobility is not very appreciable at all. So uh, for this patient, we did a split latissimus flap, and here it is, you know, nicely covering the defect and the short-term post-operative result. So I think there's a place for muscle flaps, you know, for certain indications where there's hardware exposed and really for very large defects. And everybody on this call is probably aware of the anterior lateral thigh flap, everything about the anatomy, which is the pedicle supplied by the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Um, and there's so many papers that have been published on this flap that is ridiculous. But sometimes you 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 can do it in in interesting and innovative new ways. So this is a case where we did a turbocharged ALT flap. So there's a really large defect. Again, this is pretty early in my career. Um, so I was still doing a lot more ALT flaps, but you can see we designed a pretty large flap in this case. And because the flap was so large, there was a perforator that came from the rectus, through the rectus femoris to the skin. So what we did in this case was I actually hooked the perforator from the rectus femoris to the end of the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. So this is what you call a turbocharged flap and it allows you to maintain a really large skin title. So over here, the flap is a bit thick. Um, it was in part due to some of these patients that we decided to progress towards doing more thin and super thin flaps, which, which are now a standard of care. Sometimes you end up doing an AMT flap, which is an anterior medial thigh flap. So this is a patient who had a dorsal hand defect, as you see over here. Um, and in this case, after exploration of the perforator, we found that there was instead a dominant perforator going through the rectus femoris muscle. So in this case, this flap was mostly harvested in the superficial plane, as you see over here and a pretty long pedicle that can go through the rectus femoris muscle. Uh, and this is the post-operative result. So the AMT flap is kind of interesting. I think um, a lot of uh, microsurgeons who do the ALT flap commonly are aware of the AMT variation. But this is really, uh, in many cases, like a backup to the ALT flap. So in some cases, there'll be no ALT perforators. And similarly, in this paper that came out of MD Anderson a number of years ago, 
they found that 21% of patients had no AMT perforators, anterior medial thigh perforators. And that of those patients who had AMT perforators, uh, in a total of 100 patients, only 51% of them had rectus femoris branch perforators that could be used as a pedicle. But where it's present, you can even harvest two skin paddles on a common pedicle, which, which is very useful if you're trying to fill a very large defect. But I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about my current favorite flap, which is a super thin profunda artery perforator flap. So the profunda artery perforator flap is a, a flap that has become more popular in recent years for breast and head and neck reconstruction in the plastic surgery world. And it's really based on this pedicle that you can see on this diagram on the right side that goes posterior to the gracilis. So it actually has it's a very large, uh, very large caliber vessels that you see sometimes when you dissect behind the gracilis and the pedicle can be as long as like 12 centimeters. So here's a diagrammatic representation. It's actually posterior to the gracilis. And most of the published literature has been on breast and head and neck reconstruction. And there have been very few papers that use it for extremity reconstruction. And one of the reasons for this is that it tends to be rather thick um, because the, most people's posterior medial thighs are kind of thick. And this is very useful when you're trying to have a lot of bulk for breast and head and neck reconstruction. But in the extremity, what you really need is a thin flap. So before we started doing um, a thin and super thin flaps, we, we did a radiological study. And as mentioned, uh, the disadvantage of the traditional subfascial pap flap are that this is thick and the, the artery can be small unless it's traced close to the origin. But the advantages of the pap flap are numerous. There's a concealed donor site scar, large perforators that can be seen pretty much on any preoperative CT angiogram and M MRA, long pedicle and a straightforward pedicle dissection. So um, the concept of thin and super thin flaps was really popularized by the group in Korea in Asan Hospital. Uh, us in, uh, and they, they use it mostly for elevation of ALT flaps as well as skip flaps, as you see over here. So the idea is that the flap is elevated on the scarpa's fascia, so you don't have to go down below the fascia, so you can make the flap as thin as you need, regardless of the patient's body habitus. So the idea is that the flap is elevated pretty fast at the periphery, which is what you call the cold zone, and then when you get close to the perforator, then the dissection slows down in what you call the hot zone. So, so that you carefully preserve the blood supply to the flap by allow the flap to be thin as well. So before we started doing the super thin pap flap, we did a radiological study. And, um, and we looked at a consecutive series of patients who had the uh, CTs of the lower extremities for various reasons, 80 of them, and mapped out the location and caliber of the dominant profunda artery perforator on both thighs. So here's, here's how it looks like. This is a typical CT scan. And really, you see this perforator on pretty much all CTAs of low extremity because it's so big. You don't always see anterior lateral thigh perforators because they're quite small, but you pretty much can always, always, uh, almost always see a profunda artery perforator. So it's on the posterior medial thigh, and we measured the proximal distal distance from the groin crease. And we found there are two main morphologies of the superficial anatomy of the pap perforator. Um, there's a what we call a T perforator, which is where the bifurcation of the perforator is pretty close to the skin. And there's a Y-pattern perforator where the bifurcation is pretty deep, closer to the, the fascia. And I'll talk a little bit more about the clinical implications of this. And just some videos. Um, so we found that musculocutaneous perforators were predominant. Uh, most people had dominant T perforators. Smaller proportion of people had dominant Y perforators. T perforators were more common in women. And there's a higher mean BMI of the T perforator. And what we found later on in our clinical study was that the branch point of the T perforator correlates to the super thin flap thickness. So what this means in, in, in a really simple fashion is that if you're trying to elevate the flap on the scarpa's fascia, you can estimate the anticipated thickness by measuring the thickness from the skin to the bifurcation point of the T perforator. So that, so that if I look at this CT, I'll anticipate that if I raise the flap on the superfascial plane, the thickness of my flap is going to be 13 millimeters. Um, and this is pretty accurate. Uh, so you can look at the CT scan beforehand and anticipate the thickness of the flap that you can elevate raising on the scarpa's fascia. But there's no correlation of the flap thickness with the Y perforator branch point because the perforator branch point tends to be deeper down at the fascia level. So this is more for preoperative planning. But really the way we do this is uh, there's a good deal of preoperative planning involved. The CT is used to localize the proximal distal location of the dominant perforator. And then intraoperatively or preoperatively before the flap is actually designed, the location of the perforator is further confirmed with color Doppler or duplex ultrasound and a handheld Doppler. And then the flap is centered on the dominant perforator and the flap can be elevated with a custom thickness based on the requirements of the defect and whether this is a T or Y dominant perforator. So we published our initial clinical series in PRS last year as well. And this describes our technique uh, using duplex ultrasound to customize the flap thickness and by, by centering on dominant perforator. 
And in this series, the mean flap thickness was seven millimeters plus minus two millimeters. So pretty thin. And really, I think um, just as a segue, ultrasound has really revolutionized my practice in all respects, but particularly, particularly in reconstructive microsurgery of the extremities. And ultrasound really allows very accurate perforator mapping for a planning of free flaps. So uh, when you do a thin or super thin flap, for example, a PAP flap or ALT flap, if you know where the perforator is, then you can just design the flap exactly on the perforator. The flap elevation is extremely fast. There's no guesswork involved, involved at all, and it's just much easier. Um, it can be used for pedicle perforator flap planning, for example, in propeller flaps, or other local pedicle flap used for coverage of the upper and lower extremity. And I've used it as well uh, in mapping of the vessels for toe transfers. So if you're not sure whether it's a dorsal dominant or plantar dominant system, then you can use the ultrasound to map uh, the pedicle beforehand. And this really saves the guesswork uh, from the flap elevation. We have a paper that describes um, and discusses more about the application of ultrasound for perforator mapping and flap design in the hand upper extremity that is uh, currently available online in JHS and should be coming out pretty soon. And this really describes basic principles for using the color Doppler ultrasound for mapping of perforators for flap planning. This is one of the, the cases from that paper. It's an ALT flap, um, pretty traditional ALT flap that was harvested in the super fascial plane. But you can see that the ultrasound in this case allows you to map the perforator exactly and know its core. So you know it's going to go in like this zigzag fashion before going through the deep fascia. And we're able to center the, the flap directly on the perforator so that when we elevated the flap, we knew exactly where the perforator was. So there's no guesswork involved and the flap elevation is extremely fast. I'd like to show some of our cases using the super thin profunda artery perforator flap for extremity reconstruction. So uh, we're gonna go actually from proximal to distal. This is a 15 year old female, high velocity gunshot wound to the arm in a drive by accidental shooting. And there's an exposed plate that you see somewhere inside. There's a defect on the anterior arm. So here we have mapped up the dominant perforator on the posterior medial thigh. And the flap is actually elevated in the super thin plane, which means you leave most of the fat, surrounding fat behind. And the flap itself is pretty thin. So you can see that the flap is a pretty nice contour. There's a very large caliber of the dominant perforator. So, and the perforator of the PAP flap, unlike the ALT flaps or other flaps, just goes straight in. So I find the dissection personally a lot easier uh, than like the ALT flap, which sometimes goes around in circles and it's not always there. And here is the immediate post operative result. You can see a pretty nice contour of the surrounding skin. And then when you look at the donor site, as you see over here, you can see it's on the posterior medial thigh. So really, um, so really you see that it's, it's pretty well hidden. And then when she's, I'm sorry, my slides keep moving, but when she's standing and facing you from the front, you cannot even see the scar at all. So this is one of the reasons why the, the PAP flap has become my preferred flap for extremity resurfacing. Another patient with a medial elbow wound, 18-year-old female who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, no local flap options due to previous interventions, had previous at an attempted failed local flap coverage, and also had a previous AIN to ulnar motor branch nerve transfer that done by somebody else. So because of that, we could not do any local flap for coverage of this medial elbow wound. So here it is. It's really a pretty tiny wound if you think about it, but we end up doing a free flap, dissected out the superior ulnar collateral vessels, and a pretty small uh, super thin pap flap. And again, the flap is pretty thin and uh, it's used to resurface the defect. So, you know, I, I kind of always make the same joke because this is what happens when you let me put an X-fix in the upper extremity because I'm just looking to make like a uh, offloading X-fix. You know, I don't really care if it works a lot. Obviously it works to immobilize the elbow. It's maybe a bit overboard, you know, but it worked for the flap. So here's the uh, short tempo subjective result, a pretty nice contour of the flap in the medial elbow. Another case over here, lateral elbow wound. 65-year-old male who's involved in a motor vehicle accident, exposed lateral elbow joint, and required lateral collateral ligament reconstruction of the elbow. So after that was done, we harvested a, a PAP flap again. And in this case, the flap was really thin. So I re didn't really even have to elevate it much in the super thin plane. This was more of a subfascial flap. But you can see in this case, this guy was kind of thin. So the flap is about three millimeters thick. So there's a very nice contour when you put it on the lateral elbow uh, that matches the surrounding skin. Here's an example of a form resurfacing a nine-year-old male with a deep gloving injury. So in this case, I like to show the ultrasound. And you can see that um, if you pay attention uh, or if you look closely at this, you can see that the perforator almost looks like a Y. So I, I, we have found that the, the morphology of the perforator correlates very strongly with what you see on the CT. So again, the Y perforator here that you see on ultrasound, it correlates pretty much with this Y pattern perforator that you see on the CT. So, you know, with this, this imaging, you're just able to just know what you're going to encounter pretty much in advance. 
And then again, the perforator is mapped up beforehand. The flap is centered on the dominant perforator. And then we go ahead and elevate it, leaving most of the surrounding fat in place. So the flap is elevated in the super thin plane, like you see over here, so that the surrounding fat is all left in place. And the flap itself ends up being rather thin. Uh, it's probably about seven millimeters or so. And that's the post-operative result. Another case here, a female with uh, burns, with first web space contracture, and uh, everything is quite stuck. So in this case, the preoperative CT showed a T-pattern perforator where the bifurcation of the limbs of the perforator is pretty close to the skin. And then here we can see that the preoperative duplex correlates to it as well. Um, you can see that the distal limb of the perforator ends up being near the skin. So again, it's a pretty good match between the CT anatomy and the ultrasound anatomy. And then here we go ahead and elevate this flap. Again, the super thin plane and leaving most of the fat behind. And uh, this is a bit more bulky than I liked it to be. Um, and part of the reason is it's just I, had, I, I probably took a bit too much flap to ensure that there wouldn't be you know, stretch of the flap. But after you know, the swelling has come down, this is the post operative result. Um, pretty good movement and function. So another case of a hand wound, a 24-year-old male who uh, was involved in a motor vehicle cause, uh, collision had a dorsal hand wound, as well as extensive tendon injury. So the ultrasound showed a dominant Y pattern perforator, as you see over here again. So you can almost imagine a Y. It's very hard to illustrate the ultrasound on the video uh, because it really is not, it's not a still study, it's a dynamic study. So you have to keep moving it around, but you can almost appreciate a Y pattern with the bifurcation pretty deep now near the, near the deep fascia. But again, we're able to design the flap exactly centered on the dominant perforator. And you can see this perforator is huge. You know, it's, it's, it's much bigger than ALT perforator. And then we're able to elevate the flap. And this flap in this case is again about six millimeters thick. So a uh, pretty nice uh, contour that matches the, the dorsal skin. So um, I think at least for super thin pap flaps, um, there's a reason why this has become, you know, my go-to flap. Preoperative CT and duplex allows design of customized single perforator flaps. And I think this flap has many advantages. It allows a thin flap with customized thickness, concealed donor site, and it's well suited for upper and lower extremity reconstruction. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some interesting bone um, and skin cases and composite cases. So um, for bone reconstruction, I think this is the same for all of us. The fibular flap really is the workhorse. And my personal second line flaps are scapular flap as well as the medial femoral condyle flap. So this is a this is a somewhat more interesting application of a fibular flap. A 63 year old male who had a tree four on his forearm had a radius bone defect as well as a dorsal forearm skin defect. So I find this pretty interesting because you know the the perforator that goes to the skin pedal for the fibular flap is normally next to the bone, so that means it doesn't have much mobility. So you typically think that if you insert the bone bowler, then the skin pedal has to be bowler as well. But this is a dorsal form skin defect, right? So what do you do? Um, but anyway, I'll show you what I did in just a little bit. He had an antibiotic spacer placed at the outside hospital. And this was the initial x-ray, pretty comminuted radius and ulna fractures. And then they put on an fix to immobilize the ulna as well as this antibiotic spacer that you see over here. So uh, I actually designed this. This is uh, what we call a kiss flap. Um, a kiss flap is, is it's not keep it simple, stupid, but it's, it's similar. It's, it's basically when you try to take multiple skin pedals to resurface a larger skin defect, and this allows you to close the donor site primarily. So in this case, here you can see that there's the, the, the bone segment of the fibula, and then there's the, the perforator that comes from the, the next to the bone that goes to the distal skin pedal, and then there's an intramuscular perforator that goes to the proximal skin pedal. So two separate skin pedals. And we're able to insert them side to side like this so there's enough mobility of the skin paddles to resurface the dorsal skin defect as well as reconstruct the bone on the bowler side. So in this case, this is a short-term post of result as you see over here. And, uh, and here's the, the osteosynthesis. So I did have to go back and do an ulnar shortening, um, which I did, and he went on to heal and, and do pretty well. So this is an example of a more typical fibula flap. A uh, young lady who was involved in a role of an MVC um, Pretty uh, significant radius bone gap, six centimeters, as well as a distal ulnar fracture of bone loss and a bowler skin defect and a median nerve gap. So here she is when she comes in, it's pretty smashed up as you can see. So I went ahead and uh, debrided everything and put an antibiotic spacer and put an X-fix. Probably you guys would have done exactly the same thing. 
and then uh, bring her back to do a free fibula to resurface the bone defect as well as to cover the skin. So there's a more typical fibula flap in that there was just a single skin pedal based off a subcutaneous perforator. So here's the X fix and the bone segment in place, and then the skin pedal covers the volar form defect. So, uh, you know, as with a lot of our patients in Florida, she disappeared and never came back. So I just have to assume that she's doing well, but maybe she's, you know, floating around in Georgia somewhere. Um, you know, I did have a patient that, that I actually fixed bilateral distal radiuses on, and there was an X fix on one arm. And then one of, I, I can't remember one of our residents or somebody was driving back from a conference and told me that he saw the patient at a gas station in Georgia. So I'm sure I have with the X fix on. So I'm sure I have patients like that outside, you know, all over the place because it's Florida and people in Florida just do interesting things. So another flap that I do like for bone reconstruction is the vascularized scapular bone graft. So we published an anatomical study um, looking at different uh, patterns of the pedicle uh, and, and in, when, when the vascularized scapular bone graft is harvested from the supine position. So there are five or six um, typical patterns of the anatomy for the origin of the angular branch of the thoracodorsal artery, which supplies the scapular bone flap. And you can see that most of the time, the angular branch of the thoracodorsal arises from the main thoracodorsal pedicle. It can also arise from the scapular, I'm sorry, from the serratus, uh, uh, branch, the serratus branch or from the distal thoracodorsal artery, as you see over here. So in this study, we found that there was a sixth anatomical variation. It's hard to see on the, anatom on the cadaver dissections on the right side, but the new variant we found had four branches arising from the posterior division of the thoracodorsal artery. But beyond this anatomical study, um, I just want to show you a case, which was in our paper as well. So I find the scapular flap useful for shorter bone defects. So in this case, this guy had a um, shotgun injury to his forearm and uh, somebody else put a plate and obviously he, did, he got an infected non-union. So one of my partners did a pedicle uh, abdominal groin flap, which covered the defect. And then I went ahead and harvested um, vascularized scapular bone graft. And this is from the supine position like was used for the split lattice mass flap. So you really can harvest a good segment of bone as you see over here. And just a video showing the excellent bleeding. Yeah, and, um, and that's the anastomosis, as you see, end to side to the radial artery. So um, this is a short-term post result. So I think for short bone gaps, you know, the scapular flap, bone flap is a good second choice, especially if you can harvest it from the supine position. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some more interesting of my medial femoral condyle cases as well. So I think the medial femoral condyle flap is really known for uh, scaphoid uh, non-union reconstruction. And I think it's really the group at Mayo that has really popularized this as well as a number of other people. But it can really be used for all other manner of uh, bone reconstructions as well. So this is another patient of mine, a young guy who was involved in a motorcycle collision with multiple fractures, underwent ORF of the distal radius fracture and then a revision ORF with that crest bone graft. And then he broke his plate and extruded and he broke his wrist again. So I think he had probably like three or four surgeries before he came to see me. So here he is. Uh, he also had Crohn's disease, so it's not a, not a great healer on steroids. But here you can see there's obviously a malunion of the distal radius, and this is seen again on CT. So what I did, and this is uh, the preoperative image of the distal radius. So what I did was a vascularized cortical periosteal graft, which I think it's very useful for, for various indications, and, and you may have done this as well for various reasons. So in this case, uh, vascularized cortical periosteal flap is harvested from the medial femoral condyle. And I end up taking a non-vascularized bone graft as well. Pretty well perfused, as you see over here. And in this case, I took a non-vascularized bone graft to fill the dorsal bone defect. And then I use um, the vascularized cortical periosteal flap to wrap the dorsal bone graft, as well as the whole uh, non-union site. So here you can see the anastomosis with an anthocyte to the radial artery, as well as the veins. And this is the short-term post the result, I think like three or four months showing fracture healing. This is a more recent case that I did, a chimeric MFC, 28-year-old male with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the right hand, had bone and skin defects, uh, actually had a very large dorsal skin defect, as you see here. This is an antibiotic spacer that, uh, that they have faced. And uh, after we removed the spacer, you can see it's really a true and true defect, kind of interesting. Um, so this is my fellow who has put his finger up through the hole just to show how big of a hole it is. Missing defects in the bone defects in the middle and ring metacarpals. Uh, and we have pinned it out to length. So in this case, um, 
you know, I talked about how much I like the ultrasound and how it's revolutionized my practice. So the ultrasound, again, is able to map up the location of the skin perforator that we know beforehand. Uh, you can see over here. And then we know exactly where the perforator is. And then we design the skin pedal around the perforator. And then here's the dissection showing uh, the main descending genicular artery going to the bone flap. And then you know exactly where the perforator is that's going to the skin. So we're able to very precisely and rapidly harvest a chimeric MFC based on preoperative ultrasound mapping. And then here is the bone defect in place. This is just a video showing the now nice pulsation of the pedicle to the bone graft, you know, after everything is inset. And that's the immediate post-operative result um, with the bone graft in place. So just as it happens, I actually did this, his second stage extensor tendon grafting today. We placed hunter rods in the defect um, because we didn't want to reconstruct it, you know, at the first setting. Uh, and it's six months since I did the flap. So, you know, obviously you probably want to, you probably want to do this a bit sooner, but again, it speaks to the kind of patients we have in Florida. Our patient actually disappeared and was using his hand for a long time and decided to come back. So I did this second stage extensive tendon grafting six months later. Um, and we're able to actually tunnel it through the holes left by the hunter rod, pretty conventional reconstruction. And I'll be able to tell you how he does, you know, in a, maybe in a few months. But really, uh, this is a, a whirlwind tour of microsurgery. And, you know, I hope, I hope that, um, uh, this what I've shared will be useful. And, and I think my practice in terms of microsurgery has evolved from traditional reconstructive techniques to perforator flaps, more recently to super microsurgery, which is the you know microanastomosis using very small vessels, as well as super thin flaps, which uh, really allows a customized flap thickness, incorporates all the above techniques, and really allows a very customized like for light reconstruction. And, and in, in our institution, the cap flap has become the workhorse flap for reconstruction in upper and lower extremities. So again, um, back to con current controversies. So I think that there's a role for both skin and muscle flaps. Personally, in the presence of trauma, contaminated wounds and hardware in the upper and lower extremities, I still prefer muscle flaps because I think there's some benefit just to, to having the muscle being able to fill the dead space, uh, especially if you know the trauma surgeons are doing muscular technique. I do find muscle flaps very useful and I think my trauma surgeons are the same as well. And there's a role certainly for traditional flaps for bigger wounds, for medium or smaller wounds, um, I prefer perforator flaps. And in the hands and feet, I think I've pretty much moved towards uh, super thin and uh, thin perforator flaps and super microsurgery. So again, uh, first evaluate what needs to be covered, whether it's skin, tendon, or bone. And then if there's hardware involved, personally, I still like muscle flaps. And then uh, the choice between free or pedicle flaps really depends on the amount of tissue that's needed, as well as regional scarring and availability of local options. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Love to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, and uh, um, yeah, that was awesome. I uh, quite the whirlwind and and very very cool. You're you're um, very cool how you're kind of so pushing the envelope. That's that's uh that's some that's some awesome stuff. Um, Paul, I I'd leave it to you uh, to ask specific questions. I have a couple a uh, couple questions, but I defer to you or Jack first if you all want to ask. Oh, and there is uh, there's Spencer and Chrissy and Nikki doing a replant. It looks like. So uh, Harvey, that's our is, micro uh, team right there. Harvey, this is uh, Spencer Chambers, and then behind him is uh, is is uh, is is our other fellow, Christy Schaefer, and then uh, Nikki. Is it you're with Nikki? I assume Nikki's the right. Nikki's in the far scope, yeah. and then this. We were listening and I was giving them a play by play. Sorry, we weren't didn't have a camera on the whole time. But thank you for the talk, Doctor Jim. That was pretty yeah. impressive. Pretty cool okay. stuff. So how's the replant going? Terrible. Not well. The okay. <laughs> Great, but well, the, that's the way they all go, right? <laughs> that's what we tell ourselves. Yeah. yeah. But sorry, interrupting Dr. Wagner, feel free to ask your question. But I just wanted Dr. Tim to know we were here and the talk was phenomenal. Thank Great, you. awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple of questions to start. That that was fantastic. Thanks for yeah, for thank joining you. us and giving that talk. Just um, can you tell us a little bit like logistically about ultrasound in your practice? Who does the ultrasound? Is it you that's that's doing it or do you have vascular ultrasound people that do it for you? And is it inpatient? Is it outpatient? Or do you do it like intraoperatively as you're marking the flat out? How, how does that work? So I actually do it myself. Um, you know, I've been doing it probably, it's probably about more than two two years, coming on three years now. 
And there's definitely a bit of a learning curve, but what's the, once you're used to it, you know, it takes less than five minutes. So what I do, mm -hmm. I used to, when I first started out, I would um, go to see the patient beforehand and map the perforator on the floor. But now I just do it on the table once the patient is intubated before I actually elevate my flap. And it, it just doesn't take that long at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and logistically, it seems easier. The ultrasound's right there usually, even though yeah. you don't have to like track it down and take it to the floor and everything. Yeah, and then when a... you're, yeah, when you're doing your, um, the latissimus from the, you know, supine approach, do you, are you bumping the patient up to get access to that? Or how easy is it to do that? Because I love that idea. Uh, it's, it's really easy. I don't put a bump at all. So you, the patient is completely supine with the arm out uh, abducted 90 degrees. And then you just make an incision along the anterior border of latissimus. And then you just go straight down. You know, actually my, my, my residents will tell me that after having done a number of these, when they try and go back to the traditional approach, it's actually more difficult. Because when you're in the supine position, you know, it's harder to get most of the flap, but it's easier to see the pedicle. But when you're on a lateral position, mm -hmm. you know, it's opposite. But the part that you really want to yes. see is the pedicle, right? So when you're supine, what happens is the flap falls away so you can see the pedicle. So the dissection is very easy and straightforward. So, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. so that, that's why, you know, I, I think uh, our residents like it. If you need to harvest a bigger flap, you can put a bump centrally under the spine, like a vertical bump. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can harvest essentially the whole latissimus flap, which, you know, I've done for like, sometimes you need a really big flap for head and neck reconstruction. You need a full latissimus. So in that case, I put a bump under the spine and harvest the whole flap. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, going back to like, in general surgery, whenever I would do like an axillary dissection, I mean, you see the 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 vessels very clearly from the anterior approach. I mean, you're right, right. You're seeing the pedicle is very easy. Right. That's that's awesome. Yeah, Harvey. Um, from a uh, um, do you, do you incorporate ultrasound in the other areas of your practice? Uh, I'm trying to actually. So, uh, the, um, I'm trying I'm trying to incorporate more in like you know like carpal tunnel and trigger fingers and and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I haven't done it routinely. Are you guys using ultrasound much? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I like it. I, I think it's fun di diagnostically, not therapeutically, but, um, uh, I, I like it. I think it's, 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 it's cool. Yeah. For carpal tunnel, for tendon stuff. Um, I think you can, you, the patients sort of seem to enjoy it a lot. And, um, and then, and then my, I, I sent my PA to a bunch of, uh, ultrasound courses. So she does ultrasound guide injections of sort of, of sort of everything. But I think do you do you use it yourself at all for any yeah I, yeah I do so we have it in our clinic and like um I, I'd say probably at least fifty percent of the patients I see um my team's already rolled the the ultrasound in there and then we uh and then we sort of go through the ultrasound and and with we sort of go through whatever it is on the ultrasound with the patient so it's it, I find it really fun um or the patients seem to find it really fun and we've kind of made a way to make it relatively efficient yeah yeah I like it as well. I think I think this is really going to be the future, you know, ultrasound. I do. What are your thoughts on ultrasound guided carpal tunnel release? That's something that we've been sort of uh, pushing pushing around, and I know Alex Shen has sort of really taken a taken an affinity to it. I I don't know. I'm I'm still a little bit on the fence about it because I do endoscopic carpal tunnel release, yeah. and it, it works it works just fine. You can see really great. Yeah. Um, and you know the incision is not that big either, so yeah. I um I haven't really made the move. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Are you doing endoscopic or open? I do it in this topic. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I have to say, I love the, uh, the, the lot. I, I forever, uh, so one of my, you know, as you know, one of my sort of passions is this very ten transfer on the shoulder. And, uh, and um, I always tell my plastic surgeons the importance of the, of the lat and, and, and how it's not just a donor muscle to cover tissue, uh, um, soft tissue. So I love that you have a paper that actually em emphasizes that point. And so I can, I can, uh, I can, I can reference that now instead of just telling them the importance of it. Well, well now, you know, if they harvest the lat, they can harvest a split lat and you can still use the lat for a tendon transfer for some exactly. other reasons, right? Yeah. It's a massive yeah. muscle. So there's plenty, yeah. plenty to go both ways. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that's fantastic. I knew you were going to appreciate that, Eric, whatever he presented that. I was like, man, this is perfect for you. <laughs> we commented on that. The Chart came up with a dash form like Dr. Wagner is going to quote this in perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. It's a fair point. <laughs> Very true. No, Are you doing a lot of tendon transfers, Eric? Like in your practice? Like Boston? Yeah, yeah. Boston? It's it's uh yeah, it's been it's been fun. Um uh so uh, Nikki and I um have, have started this break complex clinic and so I do I do kind of a lot of the a la Boston Milson type of tendon transfers, so like pedicle uh for deltoid and, and lower trapezius for extra rotation and 
contral atrophies and some scapular tendon transfers and, and bipolar and stuff like that. So it's been, uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's fun. It's, I, I really enjoy that. Those, those cases. Please stop. Um, gotcha. Do you have anything? Yeah, no, I was going to actually ask Harvey. Harvey, it's good to see you. That was a phenomenal talk. Yeah, so, good to see you. Thank so you. It's always uh, uh, interesting to see all these things that I routinely do not do. <laughs> yeah. um, but with that said, um, one thing that I feel like I've been seeing more and more of, and I don't know if it's because our burn surgeon, our most senior burn surgeon died, is I'm seeing a lot of these patients back with um, these burns with significant contractures to the back of the hands. Um, and they've essentially all had split thickness skin grafts or, and things like that. And they've got these horrible contractures. What are, what are, are you seeing any of these patients? What are you doing for them? You know, how are you doing one finger at a time? Are you doing other types of thickness or types of grafts to the back? Are you doing like these thin perforators to try and get them released and provide coverage or, or what's your go-to? Um, well, I think if it's a big defect, I tend to do a free flap, um, you know, rather than skin graft, especially it's been skin grafted before. And there are really a number of flaps you could do. You could do like, um, um, I have some patients I've done like a super thin pad because you can get pretty thin. And then some people would do like a skip flap, uh, which is pretty thin as well to resurface the defects. Um, or if it's small, you can do a pedicle flap, um, like from the forearm if it's not burned, like a posterior interruptus artery flap. Um, but I, I, I think for me, I, I tend to lean towards microsurgery if there's a big flap. Um, because I, I think it solves the problems. But I really think there are many, many ways to skin the cat. You know, and my preference is is if it's a big defect, I'll just do a free flap to cover it. I was just telling uh, Paul we've got a free fibula to humerus coming up. Oh, that's cool. That sounds like a fun case. Yeah, it's uh I think he's only had like four surgeries to his humerus. So Oh, I'm even sure. more fun. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. Do, do you guys do team these cases? When you do like a free fibula, I mean, do you have two surgeons? Um, yeah, so in that in that case, we will. Um, Paul Paul will be taking the fibula while I'm getting um, the humerus exposed and all that stuff. Yeah, that's that's the best way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure our, my fellows who are listening in are probably salivating. <laughs> um, We're gonna do that like next week, or when were you thinking? Yeah. No, it's a, it's gonna be a few weeks. He's got. I we're get, I'm having getting an MRI just to make sure there's no osteo, and then he's got to get some lab work. And once that call comes back, then we'll get a date with uh where Paul and I schedule a line. Yeah. Sounds phenomenal. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Harry, for uh, escape point non unions, are are you are you an MFC person or or how how do you approach those? You know, honestly, I've I've moved less to I've moved away from free flaps. And I think a lot of people have done that because I think there's a lot of literature showing showing that even if you just do a good bone graft, the outcomes are the same. I, I don't know what you think about that. You know, when we're actually at Mayo, I know they did MFC for everything, but I've, I I found in my experience that you can get away very often with, with just bone grafting. And I really reserve the MFC for like, you know, humpback deformity, proximal pole non-union, where there's no other option. How about you guys? Do you do the same thing? Yeah, so I, I've actually gone to, and, and or a couple of us have gone to uh, uh, arthroscopically treating vast majority of them. Uh, I had some, uh, started this about two years ago, I had some nice successes with it and sort of honestly haven't, haven't opened an escape with union union since. Um, started out doing, uh, with one of my partners, doing a couple of MMCs and a couple of the uh, um, like Matalons and and uh, Citrianos, but I've literally I think in two years now haven't two two and a half years now haven't opened it. It's been it's been a kind of a fun fun experience with it. I know I know some of my other partners uh, um, do a bunch of vascularized bone grafting still, but um, Mike and I and and uh, and your co fellow have, have uh, been been doing this this arthroscopic treatment, and it's been pretty fun so far. That's cool. So, and do you have long-term outcomes? The union rate is pretty much the same. And it's yeah. so, so far, knock on wood, probably now that I say this, I'm going to see somebody in clinic that's non-union, but um, <laughs> knock on wood, I have not had a non-union with it. Yeah, it's been it's been good. But like I said, I only started about, I think my first one was about two, two and a half years ago. So I don't have long-term outcomes, but I do, we do have, I do get CTs on everybody at, at somewhere between three and four months. And so I, I do have a pretty good idea if they've united or not. So like like if you had a smoker and a really bad candidate, what would you do for non-union? Would you do anything different? Yeah, so so a smoker, uh, I, I would make him quit smoking, <laughs> quite frankly, <laughs> um, just because uh, uh, just because I think with a non-union, I mean you have some time, it's not not as urgent. Um, the uh, but no, I, I mean I think um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, well, I mean, I, we, get, we get, this is off topic, but uh, I do think there's some value in, in keeping so the capsule and, and keeping the, the the native vascularity intact and not taking anything down. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a uh, that's obviously to be de- to be debated a bit, but um, but it, but mechanically, you can get really nice compression, get a fair amount of bone um, sort of packed in there. I don't know. It's been I, so far we've had some really nice successes, humpback and not humpback. So. I used yeah. to do a bunch, Harvey. I used to do a bunch of the one-two um, graphs, and I just was never really happy with them. In all honesty, um, it, you know, obviously most of them are all proximal non-union, so it's kind of hard because it's, you're asking for tough stuff. But for waist fractures, I think we've now switched to exclusively arthroscopic. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's interesting how you know. Um, you start off becoming a lot, you, you start off being very aggressive and trying to do, you know, the maximally invasive and then you find the minimally invasive technique works as well. And I've gone the same way as well. I just bone graph a lot of them and they seem to do well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know you get brainwashed a little bit when you're in Rochester, Minnesota and all you hear is MFCs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but no, you know, no. I, I was, I was talking to Shin the other day and he even told me that the way they, they do plexus has changed. Interesting. They, yeah, so I, I think they're probably evolving as well, and maybe they're not even doing as many MFCs as they were previously. That's nice. Yeah. Well, it's good. I mean, it, it shows you're, you're, if you're not changing, you're probably not really paying attention to your outcomes, right? Because like yeah. the field is changing. So if you're not changing, you're probably being left behind a little bit. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, no, that's awesome, Ari. Um, yeah, well, we, we really uh, appreciate this. Um, uh, Spencer, ask uh, Christy, uh, Christy or Nikki if they have any questions for Harvey. No questions from those two. I would have liked just more of like a broad question. Dr. Chan, in terms of starting out, like all of the cases you presented are very cool and very complicated. As like a young surgeon, I don't know if I would be as keen to jump to like the multi-segmental flaps and everything else. How do you start doing that and i know that's kind of a silly question but you just start or is that something where you started simple and got gradually more complicated i um i don't know i don't know if there's a right answer to that i think you have to see you have to do the right operation for the right patient so you might start up in a job where you just end up you know on day one you get the most complicated patient in the world then you just have to rely on your experience your training and your reading and try and figure out the best solution um or you, you might have the opportunity if you, you're in a group practice, you know, and you have senior partners and you just start out simple, you know, just two team your flaps, start out simple and then gradually do more and more complicated things. Um, for me, um, I was kind of like thrown into the fire. So when I first started, you know, there really wasn't anybody else who was really interested in doing micro in my group. So it's all just me. So I started out, um, my first, my very, my very first case out of fellowship was a reverse radio form osteocutaneous uh, flap for thumb reconstruction which is a really cool case um, that is a cool case. really cool yeah i was like i had this guy you know who had like a thumb amputation and and didn't really want to actually actually it was because because you know the 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 resident had told the patient beforehand that he was going to get a reverse radio farm osteocutaneous flap because he thought it was going to be cool then he told me that this was what he told the patient was going to get i was like okay so that's what we did um that's a true story so that was my first case. Um, it's not a great first case, but you know, fortunately, it worked out. So I really think you have to kind of see what situation you're in and just find the best solution for the patient and just just trust in your training, you know, and what you've learned. And if not, just open a textbook and it'll be fine. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Yeah. No, how are you? How are you traveling? Or fun coming up? Um. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm actually going to Egypt. Um. There's this uh. There's this conference that's actually organized by this uh, group, um, Egyptian Society of Hand and Microsurgery, uh, later this month. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, that'll be that'll be fun. So I think um, Warren Hammett will be there and and Bob Zabo as well, a bunch fantastic. of other people. So looking forward to that. I I uh, part of the reason I'm going is just because I've never been to Egypt before, so it's just an excuse to travel, man. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. I have not been there either, but that's definitely a bucket list place. That's awesome. Yeah. How about you? Any traveling? Uh, my wife's due in a month or so. So, so no, uh, she'll kill well, me if I travel at this point. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank congratulations. you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm doing, I'm doing a whirlwind of uh, Australia in a week. So we'll see how that goes. It's uh, flying out Friday, flying back Friday. I thought it was a, a month, Gotcha. It went down to a week. I was never going to know. I, I couldn't be gone. For, 
No, I'm gone. The the other weeks I'm going to Turks and Caicos with the family. And so it's like a disaster, a disaster of a week in Australia back for three days and then another time zone in Turks and Caicos for like a week and some change. Didn't you just come from Turks and Caicos? Yeah, that was just my wife and I. Now we're taking family. Where's Dr. Sue? Does she know that you're going to like come in for her title? Can I yeah, the surgeon of leisure. Yeah. yeah Australia is for work, actually. I'll be actually where you're going um spencer so I'm, gonna, I'm doing a, i'm doing a grand round slash um uh journal club with them and then uh i've got uh some study stuff with the university of queensland at their big uh public health policy stuff that we got some grants together that sounds awesome but yeah i have to fly coach because the business class tickets were nineteen thousand dollars and no one's going to cover that so <laughs> it's gonna be a long 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 trip I'm not looking forward to it, but let me know. That's awesome. Any excuse to travel. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Harvey. Um, if we don't have any more questions, let's uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll let you get on with your night. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, and and for everybody who wants to review this later on, um, it, oh, I'll post on the, our Ebershim YouTube at some point later on this week. Harvey, have fun in Egypt um and and look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon yeah thank you so much you know it's 